This episode of Sewing with Threads is brought to you by Oliso. Together, Oliso and Mimi G have created a unique iron just for you. This is an exciting collaboration, and we bet you can't wait to start using this iron. Mimi always says, if you sew a seam, you press a seam. Sewing machines are our most valuable tool, but our irons are just as important in the process of creating. We hope you enjoy the Mimi G Auto Lift Iron. Every time you use it, you'll know it was designed with makers in mind and produced with so much love. Press on! Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast with the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm Janine Clegg, Managing Editor of Production, and I'm joined by Threads Editor Carol Frazier. Hi, Carol. Hello, Janine. Today, joining us from Paris is Hannah Hamill. Hello, Hannah. How are you? Hello. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. Uh, <laughs> doing well. Thank you for having me here. Oh, well, we're glad you're joining us. Let me introduce everyone to you. Hannah, who's been sewing since age 12, is self-taught, and she didn't start building her own handmade wardrobe in earnest until just a few years ago when she discovered the world of indie patterns and the sewing Instagram community. She originally is from California, which heavily influences her laid-back style, but has since adapted her informal look to Paris, where she now lives with her husband, two children, and a cat. Her day job as a tour guide is not sewing related, but she draws inspiration for future makes from what she sees on the streets and in museums while she's giving tours to clients. What a great, great way to get sewing inspiration. You can find Hannah on Instagram and we'll give you that a little later um, again, but right now it's at Han, H-A-N-N underscore made where she shares her makes and snippets of her life in Paris. Well, today we're going to ask you, Hannah, to talk a little bit about uh, your sewing inspiration in Paris, and maybe you can just talk to us a little bit about your new job and, and what you see on the streets and what's been inspiring you just lately. Right. So I, my background is actually in museums before we, um, moved to Paris. And before I had my kids, I was working in museums, working at the Smithsonian, um, when we lived in Washington, DC. And so becoming a tour guide was actually a bit of a easy transition to make, (laughs) um, and easier, easier to access here (laughs) because, As it turns out, English speakers are really in demand for many jobs here. So that's a plus Um, uh, without having to go through a lot of the bureaucracy of working here in France. Um, So I have flexibility, which I appreciate. It gives me time to take care of my kids take care of my hobbies (laughs) and um, have time to experience the city while on the job and while I'm not working. So it's, it's pretty great. I give small group tours, uh, for a company, for a small American based company. Um, so I'm not one of the tour guides that holds up the umbrella to (laughs) get the group of 50 to follow them around. Um, though I see plenty of those (laughs) and more power to them. That's, that's a tough job. Um, but I get, really groups from two to eight people, um, which allows me to interact with them a little bit more personally and to, to weave in my personal interests, to weave in what I, what I observe outside of the history that I'm sharing. Um, and a lot of times that means that I share, (laughs) I share my personal interests that have to do with textiles and sewing and (laughs) fashion. Um, so that's been, that's been a lot of fun for me. That's great. So, um, do you have many people on your tours that are interested in sewing? And if so, where do you take them? (laughs) Um, well, so right now I, I mostly do tours in central Paris, um, where like Notre Dame, kind of the historic heart of Paris, uh, one of the stops on our tour that we don't go into 
but we go by as the Clooney Museum, which has the collection of tapestries, um, the the famous uh, unicorn tapestries. If you haven't seen them, they're pretty awesome. Um, then I actually I live down the street from the or up the street, depending on where you're looking. Um, from the Gobelon factory, the the textile uh, tapestry manufacturer, the historical manufacturer in Paris. Um, so there are a lot of really interesting, um, interesting things about textiles in Paris that don't have to do with fashion week. <laughs> um, though that is also very exciting and interesting. Um, and kind of more up my alley, but I also love history. So it's nice to have all of these things in the neighborhood. <laughs> so does Paris have a, like a, a garment district the way New York does? Yeah. So the, the two big ones that, I have that I visit regularly are the Sentier neighborhood. Um, Sentier is, um, I would say I know a lot of fashion students who go there that requires a lot of digging and a lot of, um, very specific needs that you're looking for. So if, um, if you're someone who needs to make a wedding gown for, for a final project or a series of, of garments out of the same fabric, you would go there and get a huge roll of fabric for probably not, uh, for like a whole wholesale price. Um, so I don't tend to shop over there though. There are some interesting smaller boutique, um, shops that are interesting to pop into, but for the most part, Sentier is for the people really in the know. <laughs> you have to, you have to be willing to really dig. Um, my favorite place to go shopping is the other historical fabric district by, uh, Sacré-Cœur in Montmartre. So up in the 18th arrondissement, uh, there's a street, uh, by the Marché Saint-Pierre, uh, which is an actual covered market, but then next door to the market, there is a fabric store of the same name. It has seven stories of fabric. It is, they claim to be the largest fabric store in the world. Um, I mean, I've never been to a seven story fabric store other than that one. <laughs> so they're probably right. Um, and built up around it are a lot of other fabric shops, um, Marché Saint-Pierre is, uh, you buy by the meter and they have literally everything that you could look for. So you would go in and there are people walking around with yardsticks or not meter sticks, <laughs> not yardsticks. Um, and they're just kind of roaming around and you have to flag them down and tell them what it is you want. And then, so you kind of have to know everything you want at once. So I feel a little overwhelmed when I go in there. Um, I have to, again, know exactly what I'm looking for to go in there. Um, do you rehearse then, your, do you rehearse your order before you go yes, in? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I Google, um, I do Google translate for anything that I'm not really sure about, or, um, I do Google translate at least for how to describe, because I would say my French is fairly, it's pretty, it's, I don't know. I'm... I'll give myself the benefit of the doubt. I, I speak good enough French that I can get around very easily um, and understand what is being said to me in a fabric store at this point, three years into our move. Um, but sometimes I have to describe like the thickness of the fabric or the hand or, you know, so many specific things that, that maybe there is a direct translation that I found online but that they show that item to me and it's not what I'm looking for. And then I'll have to say, okay, well, I'm actually looking for something heavier than this, you know? So it, so I do rehearse, but then as is true with everything in France, it turns into more of an ordeal and more of a conversation, which is fine. <laughs> um, so you can't, so, yeah. so you really don't go in to browse so much. You, it's more like I have to go in knowing exactly what I want. In that particular story, yes. Um, and that's just kind of how my personal, my how my fabric shopping style has evolved since we moved here. Because I would say in the United States, um, 
when we were living in the Bay Area, we had a Joann's close by. We had, I mean, it wasn't my favorite it wasn't my favorite to go to because it wasn't well stocked. Um, and the people who worked at that particular location didn't have as much know-how. So it was almost like France (laughs) where I had to describe exactly what I was looking for. Um, but, um, and then of course, across the Bay from us, we had stone mountain and daughter fabrics, which everyone there is really knowledgeable and knows exactly the pattern that you're working on for the most part that everyone just kind of knew everything. It was great. Um, so um, it was a different, it was a different experience for sure. When I shop here, I, and part of it is just kind of a Parisian thing where I don't want to talk to people. (laughs) Like I, I've kind of adapted. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, I just want to go in and out and, and just get what I need. Um, and so it, it just depends on the day, but, um, And also because that particular store is really big. There's Tissue Ren across the street, which is also several stories. And they have a mercery mercery that is very well equipped with um, notions, patterns, um, specific things like interfacing, um, buttons that if I can't, if I can't find something in one of the other specialty shops, I can probably find it there. Um, because there is a large mercery around the corner. There's a store that has, uh, what they call the button pool. (laughs) Like it's literally, it's this enormous bin just full of buttons with a little graphic next to it of a girl diving into a swimming pool. (laughs) So you can just (laughs) dig around for buttons. It's, it's amazing. Um, but, but just down the street, there are, several different shops that I wouldn't say are necessarily specialty shops, but they're smaller. They're a little less overwhelming. You do have to dig, but it's not, um, it's not like everything's on rolls and you're afraid to pull something out and touch it to see if it's the right fabric. Um, so my favorite store to go into is a store called Sacre Coupon and it's, I'm always telling people, if you go up there, you have to go into this store because it has all the unique, like truly, I would say truly unique and well-priced fabrics. Um, They're pre-cut. They're not pre-set lengths, but they're dead stock fabrics from haute couture houses in Paris. And they just get a ton of fabric and they just cut it up into different lengths. So you can walk in, they have it tagged with the fiber content, uh, how much fabric there is. And, um, sometimes it'll have initials of what, uh, couture house it came from. (laughs) So sometimes you'll see silk that um, I think I've seen Hermes silk before. Mm. Um, there's, there's some real gems in there. It's, it's really amazing. (laughs) It's it's really a treasure that I, you must tell us what was your best find (laughs) ever there. Oh, my best find ever. I know, I put you on the spot. <laughs> I know. Well, every, I feel like every, they're like choosing a favorite child. No. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I'm not a stasher. And part of that is just practical um, reasons because we don't have a lot of space. But it's also just not how I've ever worked. So sometimes I walk in and like a fabric will speak to me. So I just made a poppy coat um, by the fabric store. Uh, a pattern by the fabric store in the winter. And I had walked into the store and there was this wool patterned. It it was, it was this beautiful diamond, but it was wool uh, with like a diamond pattern. The texture, the white, the off white and gray gray in the background. Yeah, it was gray and off white. And it it was, um, it was on sale it was probably, it was a good three plus meters for 30 euros. Oh, <laughs> so wow. I was like, sure, I think I can make a coat out of this. <laughs> like what, there's nothing, there's nothing, it's not going to hurt, right. To try, uh, my first really, uh, like aligned coat, um, and I still, I love that coat and I am very excited to pull it out for the winter. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And then also for the, the, the project that I, the collaboration that I did with you guys with threads, um, for the luxury loungewear design challenge, they have an excellent selection of silks, um, at the store. And I don't often have an occasion to sew silk, but again, it's such a low risk place to, to buy a good amount of silk crepe de chine or, you know, I'll get third, three meters for 30 euros, which is nothing. <laughs> it's a, it feels like a very low risk venture yes. and they have really beautiful patterns and textures. And, and so I would say like the, the fancier, the fancier fabrics, because that's not really, that's not my everyday aesthetic, but it's something when I got, when I found those pieces, I was excited to try something new. So, and those fabrics really were beautiful because we got to see them in person um, yeah. when you yeah. sent them so we could take additional photos of them. Really gorgeous. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Well, Thank so you what, for doing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What would you say is your everyday aesthetic and, and how does that fit into the environment where you're living and the people you see? Yeah. So because I have two young children, my, um, my group of friends that I see every day is not really super high fashion, <laughs> but, um, I would say I have always liked comfortable clothes, but n I'm not an athleisure wearer. <laughs> I don't feel, um, I understand why people love it, but I have never, I never transitioned well into that mom uniform that a lot of uh, my friends in the U S did. Um, I always felt very overdressed and people would often comment <laughs> on my, on my clothes. Um, and so I've sort of, I would say adapted to, um, to make comfortable, practical, stylish work. <laughs> so, um, and that just, it depends on the day really. And I, I think that for me, I would say, um, you know, I have tried to give myself like style, style job titles before I would say I, I dress a lot like a French preschool teacher. Um, that is a compliment because they dress really nice <laughs> for, for spending the entire day with small children. Um, but like an effortless, effortlessly chic <laughs> preschool teacher. Um, so I try to have, um, I try not to wear everything oversized or, um, try to incorporate different colors or textures. I don't wear a ton of patterns, but if I do, I'll do like, I have a pair of Bob pants, um, that are gingham that are kind of a bold, um, a bold look for pants, <laughs> but I like to pair them with something neutral or, something else, um, like a different texture or something to make it casual without feeling like a clown. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a really roundabout way of saying <laughs> I contain multitudes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't, um, I have never, I have always felt really overwhelmed at the idea that I had to fit into some kind of box, um, as, cause I know some people are really good at making capsule wardrobes and choosing, um, curating their closet. Um, and I would say that's a very natural, uh, French sensibility too, because, uh, Parisians especially don't have a lot of closet space. They tend to wear the same things over and over and you just don't really notice it because it, it just works really well. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to do that without, um, without stifling my need to kind of change, um, my clothes based on my mood and especially, you know, my work life and my home life, um, and, uh, and my nightlife, not that I have a nightlife, but when I go out at night <laughs> with my husband, you know, to try and change that a little bit. I don't, I don't want to box myself in too much. Well, I noticed so I don't that you that answered your question. <laughs> I, I think it did. Yes. Thank you. I, and you know, I noticed that you're a big fan of elastic waist pants 
And um, I'm wondering how how you choose um, a, an elastic waist pattern. What do you look for in a pattern like that? And do you have a favorite right now? Yes. So I actually went through and counted all of my elastic waist pattern pants that I have. And I, I have six, um, five. I have five and they all have different silhouettes. Um, and so I do try to one go for a silhouette that I don't already have. Um, I look for patterns that are more size inclusive so that when I share what I've made, it can be accessible to a large range of people. Um, I also look for something, things that have maybe multiple views, um, so that they're a little bit more versatile and, you know, I, I do joke about how many different patterns I've bought, (laughs) um, but I'm supporting small designers. So I feel okay about that. Um, and they're all a little different. I started out with the Emerson pant by true bias. That was kind of my, my, um, my introduction five years ago into that silhouette and getting comfortable with, okay, yeah, I don't need to only wear skinny jeans to, to feel stylish. Um, and then kind of worked my way into, I love the Miller trousers. I've made several pairs of those by uh, paper theory. They have a really great pleat detail in the front and the option to have the elastic waist or a tie waist. And they have this really neat incorporated, the pocket is incorporated into the waistband. So I think there's only two pattern pieces. Uh, I would have to look at it again, one, two or three. It's, it's not a very complicated, I mean, elastic waistband pants are not very complicated, but when you see how, uh, the design details of those pants, it's surprising that, it's not several different steps to make them. So, so you um, say you use a lot of indie patterns. I'm assuming those are downloadable, printable at home. It, yes. Is, is it possible to buy patterns in Paris the way we would go to Joanne's yes. and get a big box full of simplicity or something? Or Yes. So um, the stores that I mentioned, um, Tissue Ren in the 18th, they have a big pattern selection of Big Four and Berta. Um, Berta's really big here. So I would, I mean, I would count that as, I, I mean, not obviously, I mean, the original indie pattern, I guess, right? Because it wasn't, it wasn't simplicity, butterick, what, what we're yeah. used to in the United States. Um, but yes, people definitely use printed patterns here. Um, and one of the stores that I shop from actually, uh, boutique, boutique mode et travaux, they're connected to Les Coupons de, de Saint-Pierre. Um, anyway, they, when you order from them online, like for me, if I order for pickup, they, inc- they wrap everything in a pattern. <laughs> so they have their own line of patterns and so I'll go, Oh, Oh, this is sure. This is great. Like one time I got a, I got a child's pattern with a matching doll pattern. So that was pretty fun. Yeah. So Do you get, does, is it um, the whole pattern? Is it like all the pieces? Yeah, it's the whole pattern. Yeah. Oh. And I don't know if they just have like an excess of them. I <laughs> just, oh. I don't know. Every time I've, <laughs> I've ordered from them, they send a pattern and it's their own line of pattern or maybe they're discontinued. I have not investigated it, but, um, people definitely do printed patterns. And I would say like, if you go into um, like Atelier Brunette, um, they have, which you probably know for their beautiful fabrics, they have an actual storefront um, with uh, patterns with many uh, English language, French language uh, paper patterns. Um, so I haven't really dipped my toe into French patterns just because a lot of French patterns have English translation. So, um, anything that is only written in French. Um, and, but there are, there are quite a few, uh, brands that have a printed line, but they also have, um, you know, their, their indie patterns too. So anyway, but the but they do have the the big the big four, but they are more expensive. So I don't tend to 
I don't tend to use that as much um, here as I did in the U.S. And even then in the U.S., I I didn't uh, I didn't use it a lot there either. So, well, how much are you influenced by seeing some of these designs on on Instagram with you know worn by people that you follow? I feel like that's a really great way for people to sort of see yes. a design on different body types and understand yes. how it can yes. be interpreted. Yes, and to make it your own. Right. Um, to see something for me, there are some things where I've seen a pattern and a fabric and said, I'm going to recreate that because I, I need that. (laughs) That's very rare. I would say that's happened with like two garments and they were basics. They were like a Cali shirt dress in white linen when I was like, of course, why don't I have one of these? (laughs) This, this is perfect. But I would say What I actually find really inspiring about people that I follow on Instagram is that I don't, I I follow a lot of people whose aesthetic is very different from mine. Um, I would never wear what like, um, buried diamond. She's a, I'm sorry that I'm using a lot of Instagram handles, but, uh, Martha Moore from buried diamond. She sews vintage big four patterns and they're beautiful and have intricate lace collars and they're not at all suitable for my lifestyle, but it is inspiring to see someone, you know, she shares these techniques that are, um, like what was sharing? Like I, she shared the process from start to finish of, um, a sheared bodice and all of the, the different dresses that she's made using the technique. And I said, I could do that. So I would say it's more, maybe, yes, there's definitely an aesthetic influence, but also an influence to try a new to me technique. Um, and I think that, and it could just be the, the group that I engage with the most. We've all, you know, there's sort of cohorts, online of people who kind of joined at the same time and found each other. And then as the years go on, you kind of see, Oh, I remember when so-and-so didn't have any followers and now they were on project runway (laughs) or, you know, all these, these really exciting, interesting things that people have done. And I think that the, what they've accomplished is kind of more, uh, inspirational to me than, um, than what they're actually wearing. Yeah. Though sometimes it's both. I know um, one of the features that you like is pockets. And you mentioned pockets before on a pair of the pants. Um, Do you ever add pockets to patterns that don't have them? And if so, do you have like a favorite kind of pocket, type of pocket that you put in? Yeah. Uh, pockets. I, I have actually gone back and forth on that since I, since we moved here, I add pockets a lot. Um, but sometimes it doesn't suit the garment. Like for example, the pants that I made for the threads challenge, they were silk and I didn't want to like, what would I be putting in silk pant pockets (laughs) that wouldn't affect the drape of the pant or the performance or being able to be held up around my waistband. Um, and also on top of that, just living in a city, um, I don't keep my phone in my pocket (laughs) as much as I used to. And that was the main, the main use for pockets before. Um, just if I'm on the Metro or out on a crowded street, I don't want to do that. So, but I am, I have a really heavy chapstick habit. (laughs) So I (laughs) I'm always reaching for ghost pockets when they're not there. Um, (laughs) I prefer an inseam pocket just for, for, uh, the look, uh, or lack of, um, on certain silhouettes. It's also kind of a more practical pocket that can hold up, uh, a lot. It can hold more than, uh, just a patch pocket on a cotton or linen garment, for example, Um, and I really like, I mentioned the Miller trousers, the zero waist dress by Birgitta Hemerson. She also has a similar technique in where the pocket is incorporated into the waistband of the dress. Um, and I, and it's secures it 
basically, you know, securing the waist, the pocket to the waistband resolves a lot of the issues that I mentioned about, you know, if you put something in that's too heavy and the pocket's flapping around. Um, yes. Though I haven't found the perfect, the perfect size, the perfect, you know, obviously a rounded pocket always better than a square pocket. That's the one thing I don't like about the zero waste dress because it calls for, if you, if it's truly zero waste, it has square pockets and that's not, that's not practical (laughs) for keeping anything in the pocket without falling out. Do you, do you um, find, have you found any inspiration with pe- with what people are wearing on the streets or even, you know, in artwork that you're seeing in the museums as you're going along in, with your tour guides? Have you found anything that you've wanted to try or that you have actually tried? Yeah, so um, in museums, I, so I was just in the Louvre a couple weeks ago and there I was up in the Medici galleries and that, so this is like, um, 17th century French and Italian, uh, painters, uh, and, um, another Flemish, uh, <laughs> thinking of the word in French, uh, Flemish painters. And they have these really vibrant colors and they're a lot of florals, a lot of, um, you know, this is when artists were really experimenting with, um, depth and detail and just adding kind of unnecessary things just because the patron who commissioned the painting was wealthy. Um, and so seeing the, um, the depth of color, um, and detail in a portrait is really inspiring. And, um, you start noticing flashes of color coming from these otherwise dark paintings, uh, which I find really interesting. Um, on the street, I would say is kind of a more common place for me. I I was just say, I would say that in an actual museum, I'm just generally inspired because museums are inspiring places to be. (laughs) That sounds really, uh, simply put, but it's just nice to be around the spirit of so many creative and interesting people. Um, and on the streets here, it's sort of the same thing. And depending on what neighborhood you're, you're strolling through, Um, so I live in central Paris. I live in kind of a, a more university neighborhood, a student neighborhood, and we live above a few student bars. So a lot of my everyday interactions are with, you know, young adults, um, in their late teens, early (laughs) twenties. So that's, um, I would say not as inspiring, except that it's more like I'm inspired that you are just wearing whatever you want and, and you don't care and no one else cares. Um, when you're in more, um, uh, let's say there's like the Rue Saint-Honoré, um, over by like Louis Vuitton and, um, Rue de la Paix and all the big fashion houses, I always feel very underdressed. Um, even if I feel like I, I dressed really nicely that day because it's very, um, fashion conscious. And so I think that those are like, that's like the Paris that people imagine, um, that people are always dressed to the nines, that everybody wears a designer of some kind. And I, it's definitely not true. Um, People might have a nice handbag or a nice brand of glasses or uh, an Hermes scarf, but really no head to toe designer or head to toe black all the time, though that is more or less true that I have been the only one on the Metro not wearing all black (laughs) many times. Um, But, but on the street, it's really interesting to see, um, especially coming from California where you basically have one season. Um, and well, two, there's hot and light jacket weather, you know, that's, <laughs> yes. there's no opportunity to wear your boots or your layers or your heavy wool layers. But, um, I, um, that was a big transition for me was <laughs> trying to figure out how to bring my California aesthetic 
here because practically speaking, I was utterly unprepared, um, for needing layers and, and something more than linen and, and cotton sweaters. Um, but you notice here that people really change once the season changes. Like, it's like, okay, once school starts in September, you're not wearing sandals anymore, even if it's hot, (laughs) you, you need to adapt your wardrobe. It's sort of like a no white after Labor Day, um, which I never adhered to (laughs) in, uh, the United States. And I even, I actually joke about this with an American friend who lives here because we're always wearing, um, tennis shoes with, um, with the low cut socks. She's like, I just can't, I just can't break this, this American habit (laughs) of not having, of my ankles always being cold (laughs) because we're both from warmer parts of the U S but, um, it's, you know, there are certain things where people are just like, Oh, you're going to catch your death of the cold. And I'm like, Oh no, I'm not. (laughs) It'll be fine. I won't get sick. Um, and so there are a lot of interesting, um, sudden seasonal shifts that everyone seems to have on their calendar um, and follows the same rules. Cause now I was noticing we just had the weather really change here and everyone suddenly their every, everything, the, the clothes have changed. And I've even seen people in down jackets and I'm like, it's only like 60 degrees outside and you're wearing a, <laughs> A puffer coat. So. Same, same thing happens in Manhattan. But so I want yeah. to ask you what what did you bake first when you uh, realized that you had no winter or uh, seasonal clothes beyond <sighs> summer? What is the first thing you made when you were in Paris? The first thing I made when I got here, I made a jumpsuit out of corduroy. It was like a bowl, a boiler suit, um, and it is warm. <laughs> it is it. It was definitely the coziest thing that I could have made uh, to to enter into the the fall and winter months, um, and those are really practical, layered with turtlenecks, and they're stylish. Um, so that was a good choice. I felt yes, I felt confident choice. about that, and I made it in a purple corduroy. <laughs> so I was I was like, I'm really pushing. I'm, I'm pushing my, my personal, uh, comfort level here by making something that is in a bolder color that isn't just black, but can fit in, you know, with the, the general aesthetic of who I'm around and without several people commenting on it, because that's us. Aw- that's often how I feel or felt when I was in the United States. Anytime I wore what, you know, not soft pants for lack of a better term that I would have a cut like, Oh, are you going somewhere? I know I'm just going to the park. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just dressed because I like to get dressed. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. people are a little bit too casual. I think that's my opinion. But <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. and I think, and, yeah. And I appreciate that here that even, people of a certain age, you know, you, you really don't, I would say after the pan post confinement pandemic, um, era clothing rules have relaxed a little bit here, but you would never see someone like we went back to the U S this summer for a month and I was just shocked at how, how many, how much athleisure I saw and how much, you know, again, I understand why that works for certain places or like bike shorts, bike shorts are not really a thing here as like a, a fashion, a high fashion item. And I saw, I was like, man, everyone's wearing bike shorts. Where, where, no one's posting about this on sewing Instagram. So I have no idea (laughs) that this is what people are wearing in the U S but I, I felt like, here, you know, you see people in their well into their eighties and nineties going out grocery shopping. And this is definitely more like a classic French, um, aesthetic, but going out full, full makeup for the women, um, a scarf, a nice jacket heels. Mine in our old apartment building, our 93 year old neighbor regularly left wearing heels. 
And it's just the, the care and attention that people have to just presenting whatever they felt was appropriate is really, you know, even if that's not, I don't like to leave the house wearing heels, but I can appreciate the dedication and, and the, the interest in, in preserving one's sense of personal style. And that's something I really appreciate about Parisian fashion. We wanted to ask you about your series of photographs in front of the doors of Paris a little bit. How did it get started and and are you going to continue it? Yeah, I know. I try, I, um, I have tried to continue it when possible. I, I have to say I first saw Lisa Kish. She is an, a, um, she has a YouTube channel called and so on. Um, she on Instagram during the confinement, um, that Europe had, we had like a true confinement in 2020. Um, she started posting pictures of doors. I was like, I, there are so many beautiful doors in our neighborhood. I should do the same thing. And I messaged her and I said, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this next year for me made May. And so in 2021, I started doing it and people just, I think I take for granted that people don't have really interesting looking front doors (laughs) and every door here has a funny little detail. You know, most, most of them have, um, have, carvings or they're painted a different color or the stonework is really interesting to look at. And so it's been, I think that people really responded in a way that I was not expecting to, um, to something different than, than their every day, maybe in the suburbs, um, or, or even Manhattan, you know, like that's a big city, but the doors are certainly not as, um, colorful. <laughs> um, you know, and, I wondered, uh, I wondered though, if, um, if you make the outfit and then you find a door that it matches or the yes. other way around that you saw yes. a door and you're like, oh, I have to make an outfit that goes with this door. <laughs> yeah. So I have unintentionally, well, my husband, he, he'll, he'll act like it wasn't his idea, but he, he will regularly find me doors and say, Oh, like if you have something that matches this and I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that I, I go so far as to make something to match a door. Cause you can find a door in almost any color here. Um, some are harder to find pink doors, definitely hard to find here. Um, but he will say, Oh, I know like if I'm wearing, I have a lot of blue and like different shades of blue and he'll say, Oh, there's a, there's a door on, on Rue such and such that is big and visually interesting. And I think it would go perfect for this. <laughs> and so when, when we were all at home, um, for the past couple of years, it was, um, it was a fun, a fun creative experiment. And this year, my husband was actually traveling during me made May and, um, cause I actually didn't want to confine it just to me made May because I, that's, that's how I started it in 2021. But then I thought, you know what, this is, uh, it's, even if it is an interesting backdrop, it is more or less neutral. Um, you know, it's just a door. It's not like, you know, something else. It's not the Eiffel tower. It's not something else to signal, look, this is where I am. So, um, so yeah, I do like if I have a new make, I'll I'll try to share detail shots in some in one grid photo and then the next one have um a coordinating door. And sometimes it's just luck that um the door the door will match what I'm wearing. Um I do there are a lot of blue and green doors, so I try to add some variety. <laughs> I do look at I look at my grid and I'll say okay, there's like a lot of brown. I think that it's time for something a little bit more vibrant. And so, so yes, there is a little bit of method to my madness, but, um, well, see, I look at, I look at those as the frame for the artwork that is you in your garment. So yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, and my kids have gotten into it. (laughs) I, I had, 
the one of the first door before I actually started with like a series of door photos, I was at the Jardin des Plantes um, near our house and there was this big, beautiful door. And I was like, I was wearing a new make and I was with my kids and I said, Oh, I, I asked my daughter, I said, can you, who was seven at the time? <laughs> I said, can you take a picture of me? And I'll often see this. I'll see this on the street in Paris a lot. And I know what I think when I see it, but then I'm like, Oh, you know, it's fine. <laughs> when I think that poor kid, <laughs> their mom is art directing a photo, <laughs> but she actually really enjoys it. She like, I, I actually think a, like I have to, I have had to let myself just have fun with it rather than, think, Oh, I'm just doing this. I, I think of it as a creative thing and not something just to, to get views or likes or like, I've just had to let go of any of that, any of that self-conscious. Um, what are the people thinking around me? Cause I remember, looking up and there was, there was a couple watching us and eating <laughs> while my daughter, <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, move over. And I'm like making these gestures and, and she's like, okay, okay. And these people are just like, what is this woman doing? And, and I think in, in some parts of Paris, yeah, like I see people art directing photos in front of the Eiffel tower all the time, like just getting, got to get the right shot. But in a, in a place that doesn't have as many tourists, people are like, I don't, this is a weird game that you're playing with your child. I don't, do we need to talk to somebody about this? So thankfully, like I said, my daughter's very, she has a creative, a very heavy creative bent and she has a lot of fun with it. And my son, (laughs) my son likes to try and make me laugh. And anyway, but I do, I do try to have an adult. Um, (laughs) I'm actually more comfortable with a child taking my photo than setting up a a monopod or a tripod. So I, you know, it's okay. (laughs) Well, you look like you're having fun. You always look, you know, happy and joyful. I am. I would say I am having fun. And if I'm not, I, I don't hide it. (laughs) That's a, that's, (laughs) <laughs> and that's okay. Sometimes I'm not having fun and I don't want to pretend like I am. <laughs> oh, Hannah, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. We really enjoyed talking to you about um, living and, and sewing in Paris. And um, we appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing more of your makes on Instagram. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It was It's always fun to to reflect on the things that really bring me joy um, about living here. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads.